Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, a warm welcome to all of you. Special thanks to Dr. Naveen Pamaraju, Andrea Connors, and Joanne Fozzi Morales for sharing their time and expertise with us today, as well as all of you who have joined our program today, especially after the weather challenges that we've been experiencing throughout the United States. We have over 1,500 people participating in today's program from across the United States, as well as Brazil, Canada, India, Indonesia, Iraq, Ireland, Israel, Venezuela, and the United Kingdom. We have seen and experienced changes due to cancer care, due to COVID, and we want to ensure that we provide you, our blood cancer patients and caregivers, with the latest information on how COVID-19 may impact you. We continue to update our information regarding COVID-19 on our website to maintain current and accurate information. We have also included developing content regarding COVID-19 vaccines. You may find all of this information on our website at lls.org forward slash coronavirus. We would like to acknowledge and thank AbbVie for support of this program. Following the presentation, we will take questions from the audience. We are also audio taping and transcribing this program for future posting on our website. If at any time during the program, you can adjust your video or slide window to a full screen by clicking the square icon at the top right corner of each box. To exit full screen mode, you can click the small square at the top right corner of the enlarged window. I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Naveen Pemaraju, Associate Professor, Director of the Blastic Plasmacytoid Dendritic Cell Neoplasm, BPDCN program in the Department of Leukemia at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. He will be joined by Andrea Connors, the Executive Director of the Patient Empowerment Network in Bothell, Washington, and Joanna Fozzi Morales, the Chief Executive Officer of Triage Cancer in Chicago, Illinois. On behalf of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, thank you all for volunteering your time and expertise with us today. Dr. Pemaraju, I'm now privileged to turn the program over to you. Well, thank you, Lizette. And before I begin, can you hear me okay? Okay, I, I'm getting a thumbs up there. Well, uh, it's my honor to be here with LLS and with my team members here. I'm looking forward to a great discussion and let's get started here with a polling question. Uh, this is exciting. So I can't wait to see the answer for all of our viewers out there. My first question is, are you planning to or have you received the COVID-19 vaccine? Yes, no. Don't know if I can even receive the vaccine, which is what we'll talk about today, and undecided whether I will get the vaccine based on um, X, Y, Z. All right, the polls are coming in. I'm seeing yes in the vast majority of people. Ooh, this is fun. Okay, the polls are still going. This does prove that we have 150 people on. All right, guys, very exciting. You see the numbers yourself. Let's see if we go to the next. So the numbers are final. The overwhelming majority of you are planning to or have received the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, only 7% in the no, but there is 12%, uh, 5% who don't know if I can receive the vaccine and a few of you out there who are undecided, perfectly reasonable, understandable. Let's chat about it. So guys, cancer care, blood cancer care in 2021, the era of COVID-19. This has been the most humbling, most sobering, maybe the most awful year uh, of my personal adulthood to see all of you, all of us going through this. The first concept here is that the in-person doctor visit has become a source of fear and anxiety for many, not only the patients and their loved ones, but even for us as caregivers, am I going to bring the virus home to my family? Should I take a shower after a long day of clinic? 
if I'm traveling from thousands of miles away, is it worth getting in the airport, going from the hospital, getting exposed to hundreds of people? The second aspect is for the caregivers themselves, most of whom are not yet vaccinated. What about the concept of bringing your loved one to the leukemia clinic, to the MPN clinic? Are you now going to be exposed to the virus? And then, of course, insurance before and after the pandemic. Before there were issues of uh, in-person visits, now there's the question of telemedicine visit, uh, et cetera. So as we think about cancer care in COVID-19, these are some of the topics that have come up. First, my practice has dramatically changed. For the first time, the telephone call is no longer simply a call to check in, here's your results, how are you doing? The telemedicine visit has now been recognized as a proper visit. It is possible to do high level medicine, including a clinical trial participant, and to be able to bill for it in, in the appropriate uh, context and states. So necessity is the mother of invention. It's unfortunate that the pandemic had to cause this, but for older patients, those who live alone, those who live afar away, those whose disease does not allow them to come in, we are doing video and telemedicine visits. It has completely revolutionized everything. Now I can see you in your home environment, in your office, in your study, with your loved one at your side. Unbelievable. We should have been doing this before COVID, but at least now we're doing it. I predict that this will be a stable part of the blood cancer process moving forward. Let's see. So telemedicine, video medicine visits uh, have revolutionized. Of course, drawbacks, you have to have the technology, you have to be able to log in, you have to be able to hear, see, there are limitations, there are pitfalls. Number two, treatments have been delayed and some clinical trials pause. Here at MD Anderson, I'm fortunate. I have the world's largest clinical trial program at my disposal. The key thing that you might be surprised to know, we did shut down things for a few weeks, first month or two of the pandemic, but then quickly, and now a year later, we've been able to have 80% of our staff working from home. What does that mean? That means you come to the clinic to see me, my PA, my nurse, masks, face shield, everything. But the research nurses are now allowed to work at home. They're able to do remote consenting with our IRB office. We're able to, in some cases, ship drug to patients home, uh, all of these on clinical trial. And so the concept of the clinical trial has been revolutionized. We're able to do a lot in the patient's home over the phone that we were not allowed or able to do before. So when you're looking at clinical trials, make sure that you are able to uh, see if your clinical trial is available to you at your home uh, office, okay guys? So that's actually very important. The next concept here is that caregivers are not able to accompany patients for in-person visits. This has been heartbreaking. This is a very sad thing to see and I can tell you for sure that this is not an easy part of what we do. Of course, for safety, we've had to cut down on the number of visitors in the clinic and in the inpatient side. Um, it, is, it has been safer to do that, but we uh, also have to figure out how to connect people to their caregiver. So what I've been doing is having people on the phone or the iPhone or the visual phone, either on the hospital rounds or in the clinic, even if they're not able to come in, and then eventually we need to figure out how to safely have everyone, whether it's having people vaccinated, mask, um, face shields continuing for a long period of time. So this is a heartbreaking part, especially for what I do, for what all of you have out there. So remember, the caregiver, even if they're not physically there, let's get them on the phone, let's get them on a Zoom call, let's get them on the iPhone, right, FaceTime, and then that way we can see each other during the visit. This is a very important part of this. And of course, yes, people are dying in, in, in the ICU without having uh, loved ones at the bedside. That's an awful part of this, but it, it's been something that we've had to figure out together. Insurance, I've noticed a little bit more flexibility, right? So the telehealth visit, being able to allow us to communicate over the phone and, and platforms like this. So that's that's been great. And then I think for medical centers, are, you know, especially a big place like mine, We've had to increase safety. So everyone's getting a temperature check when they come in. Everyone's getting a, a mask handed to them, wash hands, uh, sanitize the hands. So that's for employees, doctors, nurses, patients, caregivers, everybody. Security checkpoints should be the norm right now to check in with people. 
if you're actively sick to go to a def different designated sort of COVID area. Okay, so I think those are some of the big issues there. So what will blood cancer and cancer care look like and, and, and what do you think is gonna happen? I think in our blood cancer hematology patients, guys, the big key here is that a lot of our patients are in fact more susceptible to getting the virus, period. If you're immunocompromised already, if you're older, you have comorbidities, that's a lot of our patients. If you have some of the more aggressive blood cancers on active chemotherapy, AML, uh, possibly you have a more chance to be neutropenic and therefore a chance to get opportunistic infections. That's even before the pandemic. Now then, should you delay your treatment and what other safety measures? Of course, in general, this is a personalized decision. It has to be between you and your doctor. We can't give specific advice on a forum like this. But in general, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were worried and were appropriately delaying some of these things. But now I can tell you, we are safely able to give intensive chemotherapy. We are safely able to do stem cell transplants. And remember, blood cancers don't stop just because of COVID time. So it has to be done in a safe and secure way. We are checking the COVID test before starting a new chemotherapy regimen, before going to a stem cell transplant, possibly even checking it frequently during these things. And so the concept here is let's not delay people if we have curative therapy that's able to be given. Um, I think in the chronic MPN and CML space, there's actually very important data, very recent data that's starting to come out. If you're a patient with myelofibrosis, for example, on a JAK inhibitor, that by abruptly stopping the drug for no reason, just because of, say, fear of getting the virus or something, that can actually be harmful. So that's a big study out of Europe, Dr. Barbui and colleagues, that shows that abrupt withdrawal of your oral chemo drug, the ruxolitinib in that case, can actually lead to worse outcomes because people can have withdrawal syndromes, et cetera, et cetera. So always talk to your doctor, always serially reevaluate and seek the kind of clarity that you need for your specific disease. And remember, we're all figuring this out together. I think for future changes in care here, what I've learned out of COVID-19, I think that telemedicine visits are here to stay. So check with your local doctor's office after the pandemic is over, but that may be an option for some of you out there. So we all need to explore that as a, as a field together. I think that caregivers will be eventually invited back to appointments whenever it's safe. That may be uh, six months from now, a year from now, right? The virus has its own timeline, but I think that will happen again. In the meantime, use technology in your favor. And I think that some of the safety measures will, will last for quite a long time. Wearing masks, I think, is something that people are asking us a lot about. Remember, for a lot of my patients, for a lot of you guys out there, we were already doing that. Neutropenic patients, post-transplant, leukemia, AML. We were already doing masks, gloves, all of this stuff. Can you believe it? Social distancing. So some of that will be important, I think, moving forward. And then I want to make sure that we talk about clinical trials. We're up and running here at Anderson and at the big centers. Clinical trials are working. They're online. We're doing innovative stuff, as I told you, having folks at home, consenting from there, calling into the visit, shipping drugs. So when you look on clinicaltrials.gov, which is a freely available site, and talk to your doctor, remember that a lot of us are doing clinical trials. We are enrolling. It's a safe place here at our hospital with the measures uh, I just mentioned to you. Um, I think the key with the vaccine itself, because a lot of you will ask that, I'm sure, in the question and answer, what we're doing, every guide, every place has to have their own guidelines, right? So whatever your neutrophil count is, whatever your platelet count is, that's up to each individual practice. But if you're okay to get it, uh, we are encouraging the vaccine for the vast majority of our patients. Obviously, you have to see if you're on a clinical trial, if you need to get it on that exact day of the chemo, okay, there might be some guidance there. But yes, we do want everyone who's appropriate for it to get it. Uh, look out for allergic reactions, right? So be monitored after the first and second dose in the area where you get the vaccine. There is some question of if it's efficacious for all of our patients. We don't know yet, right? We didn't test the vaccine yet in, in many cancer patients. So many of you out there will be the first people to do it with a blood cancer. Um, and sh should I stop taking any of my medicines, right? The answer is mostly no for everybody. So you want to talk to your doctor for the specific advice there. So I think the vaccine, also we have to talk about, there's the mRNA vaccines, right? So Moderna and Pfizer, then there's the other vaccines that hopefully will be coming soon. So the mode of action may matter and we can chat about that. So I think the way I would summarize before I hand to Andrea is the era of COVID-19 has positively and negatively affected our practice. Positively would be the introduction of telehealth and telemedicine, would be the introduction of clinical trials being able to be done remotely and with uh, patients' comfort and convenience in mind. 
and the innovations that we've had to do in terms of cleanliness and personal safety here, I think will be a positive overall. I think some of the drawbacks and negatives of the era have been the lack of having the loved one physically here and never being able to really appropriately replace that experience. The lack of touch with the physical exam, handshakes and hugs in the clinic, I think you lose some of the human aspect. And then of course the fear of the virus itself, even if you're not directly affected, the so-called indirect downstream effect of having it. Um, everything else being shut down from that and, and the worry about getting it. For the COVID-19 vaccine, individualized decision between every blood cancer patient, and their doctor, but by and large, we've been able to safely give it to the, the vast majority of patients thus far. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Andrea O'Connor. She's the executive director of the Patient Empowerment Network. Very eager to hear her comments. Andrea, take it away. Thanks, Dr. Pemaraju, and uh, thanks to the LS, LLS team and, and Lizette for inviting me to be with you here today. Um, as, as introduced, I'm Andrea Connors, and I'm really excited to talk to you about telemedicine and provide some actionable and practical tips uh, to help you take advantage of it now um, in the foreseeable future due to COVID, as well as throughout your healthcare journey. So before I get started, uh, we're going to do a quick poll. Uh, so have you participated in telemedicine? Yes, no, maybe you're not aware if your physician offers it um, or not applicable. So if you could go ahead and give us your answers. I see some responses coming in. So it looks like we have had some people um, participating in uh, telemedicine already. So for those folks who have already started taking advantage of telemedicine, I hope what I'm gonna share with you today will give you some deeper insight. And for those of you who maybe haven't yet experienced telemedicine, hopefully you'll get some tips and some tricks um, that will help you be successful as you navigate telemedicine going forward. So moving on to the next slide. So I first wanted to tell you a little bit about my organization, Patient Empowerment Network. Um, so PEN is an organization that's a pan-cancer advocacy organization. And what we really focus on is increasing health and digital literacy uh, for patients and for care partners. We provide free online programs designed to educate and then help activate patients and care partners to share in decision-making with their care team. We do this because we know that empowered patients like all of you on the line today um, typically achieve better health outcomes. And, and that's what we're all here to help you with. So, what I'm going to talk to you about today is just provide some actionable tips for telemedicine, you know, under, helping you understand what it is, how it works, and what it means for you. So let's start with at the very beginning with what is telemedicine? So whether it's an appointment with your nurse, your doctor, or your mental health provider, there are times, as Dr. Pemaraju said, that it might make sense to meet with a member of your healthcare team virtually using your computer or your mobile device. Um, this approach tends to offer a little bit more flexibility and certainly can cut down in your time in the car um, or in the waiting room. And we know that transportation is, is very typically a challenge for a lot of patients and care partners. And of course, providing going to a virtual visit can help uh, decrease your exposure to illness, uh, such as COVID, which is why we've been talking so much about telemedicine these days. So today I am going to walk you through a couple of steps um, where really it can, if you follow these steps, you can see your healthcare provider for an appointment without leaving your home, um, following, as I said, some three very, very basic steps. The first is scheduling your appointment, and we'll talk through that. The second is preparing for your appointment. Just like an in-person appointment, it's very important to prepare yourself for your visit. And the third is understanding what to expect on the day of your appointment. 
So as I said, utilizing these three steps will really ensure that you have a stress-free and successful telemedicine visit. And that's what um, I hope will uh, help you today. So first, step one, it's really important to keep in mind that every provider's technology is slightly different. Uh, the platforms and instructions you receive for your telemedicine visit may vary for each healthcare system. For instance, I myself had three different telemedicine visits with three different provisor, providers and utilized three different platforms. Um, that being said, um, even though there are differences in the platforms and technology being used, there are a couple of things that you will need regardless, regardless of the platform you're using. So the first is a strong internet connection, like a home Wi-Fi network. Uh, the second is a computer or mobile device, like a tablet or smartphone. Um, that device should have a webcam and a microphone, which is the standard on most mobile devices. So once you've confirmed that you have the necessary equipment and tech requirements, uh, the next step is to ensure that your physician or clinic has an option for telemedicine by calling the appointment desk. Uh, you may be, may be able to see your options for virtual visits when you log on to your patient portal, um, or you can always, of course, um, call your provider. And once the appointment's been scheduled, it's important to ask how you'll receive the instructions for the appointment. Providers might send information to your email address or through your patient portal or messaging system. So be sure to always ask for a telephone number to call in case you have technical difficulties joining the appointment. So after you've scheduled the appointment, it's, it's really time at that point to get prepared. And a pro tip, um, and this is a pro tip not just for telemedicine, but something you'll wanna keep in mind as you uh, work online, you, you never really wanna use a public Wi-Fi connection to access personal information, as it can be very easily compromised. If you're going to use Wi-Fi, it's absolutely best to do it from home on a secure connection. It's also important to note that because you will be sharing health information during the virtual visit, your provider, your provider will use technology that protects your information. So you'll be protected on both ends, both using your home Wi-Fi and also using your, provi your provider's connection. So a couple tips for preparing for your telemedicine appointment. First, review the instructions very carefully that you receive from your provider. As I said, every provider uses a different platform, potentially a different system. So it's important to familiarize yourself with the instructions that you're given for that particular appointment. Um, then log into the portal or to the, the platform that you're using for the visit to familiarize yourself with the process and the software. Um, once again, they can be set up differently. So follow the instructions you're provided uh, quickly. So as I said, be sure to test your system. Um, most software offers this option. So you can test well in advance of your appointment to be sure that what you're what, what you're going to do um, is is easy to do with the with the computer and, and the software that you have. Ensure your audio and vi video are working properly. And if not, refer to the instructions or call the designated number to get assistance. So on the day of your appointment, you'll wanna log in at least 10 minutes early. Uh, you may have to fill out an intake form just like you do at a regular visit or sign a consent form for care. All of this can be handled online. Also, and this is very important and probably uh, most of you are already very aware of this, but make sure your device is fully charged. Just like when you have an in-person appointment, you may end up uh, waiting for your appointment to start. So you wanna make sure that your computer or your mobile device has enough uh, charge to be able to um, keep you on for the duration of the, of the appointment. So a few more considerations to keep in mind. So make sure, and all of us have been there during this sort of using virtual technology, make sure the sound, the camera, and the microphone are on on your device and check that the levels are up and not muted. And then this is always really important. Please be patient. As with most video calls, and we've all been on virtual meetings and virtual webinars this year, that things haven't gone exactly great. 
that's okay. Be patient, stick with it. Sometimes it takes a few minutes for everyone to be able to hear and see one another. So if you can't get there immediately in terms of seeing your provider or them hearing you, um, stick with it, be patient. And um, a lot of times working together, you can sort out that issue. Um, it's also really important to keep in mind that there may be follow-up um, needed from your appointment, whether it's lab work or something else that you need to have done. Um, if that's the case, your doctor will provide specific instructions about how best to handle this in this new sort of telemedicine environment. I think another really important thing to think about is when can, and Dr. Pemaruj, Pemaraju talked about this a little bit, is when is a telemedicine visit appropriate? Um, one of the things I will say is telemedicine is absolutely not for emergency situations. If there is any question in your mind whether or not um, your situation is an emergency, then absolutely call and, and speak with your provider's office. Um, telemedicine can't always replace an in-person appointment, um, but there are many types of non-emergency follow-up and monitoring appointments, and we talked a little bit about clinical trial participation um, that might be able to uh, possible to conduct virtually. Um, another great resource are the mental health resources that are available via telemedicine. Um, there's a lot available right now, and I definitely encourage you to, to, to see if it's an option for you. And as I said, when in doubt, consult with your healthcare team. Your provider can help you determine if a virtual appointment is an option for you. So all of this might leave you wondering if telemedicine is just a passing trend that will go away after the pandemic is over. Um, well, a recent survey um, suggests that 54% of physicians surveyed said that they will continue to utilize telemedicine to serve their patients um, after the pandemic has ended. So as Dr. Pemaraju said, telemedicine is definitely here to stay. Um, so if you've been delaying seeing your provider due to the pandemic, please, please consider um, using telemedicine um, and certainly ensuring continuity of, of your care. Um, so this is my last slide, and I know I've covered a lot of information in a very, very short period of time. Um, so if you'd like to learn more, um, I'd invite you to visit our website, uh, Patient Empowerment Network's website, to take advantage of the full digitally empowered course. Um, well, you'll learn all sorts of digital skills um, that will help you become more tech savvy and empower your healthcare journey. Um, the course is free, it's self-paced, and it's available to you at any time. And you can access it via the URL in the green box on your screen. Um, and with that, it's my honor and my privilege to pass the virtual podium to my friend and colleague, Joanna Morales from Triage Cancer. Um, thanks so much, everybody, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks, Andrea. That was super practical information. So one of the key things to be able to navigate the new era of care is to be able to navigate your health insurance coverage. And so my goal is to provide you with some key tips to effectively navigate coverage and kind of give you some updates about where we're at related to our healthcare system and health insurance coverage in the United States right now. So most people don't have a good understanding of their health insurance coverage. So if you feel like you don't, you're absolutely not alone. And now there's plenty of data to back that up. Uh, most people don't understand the terms of their policy or how much they're actually paying for coverage. Uh, so we're gonna talk about some basics to make sure everyone on the call today has a good understanding. So in the United States, there's only three places where we go to get health insurance coverage. We're either getting it directly from an insurance company, we're getting it through the government, and by that I mean Medicare, Medicaid, military and veterans plans, or even state or local programs. But still about 50% of people in the United States get health insurance coverage through their employer. Now, there are some key terms that we think everybody should know about their own health insurance coverage, and there are terms that relate to the cost of having health insurance coverage. We pay a premium, usually each month, just to have health insurance. So if you never got care during the year, you would still have to pay your monthly premium just to have the policy. 
But then there are costs that you pay when you get certain types of care. And usually the first is your annual deductible. It's a fixed dollar amount that you have to pay first before your health insurance coverage even kicks in. And you might have a $500 deductible or you could have a $5,000 deductible depending on the type of coverage that you have. And then there's something called a copayment. And this is also a fixed dollar amount that you pay when you get certain types of care. So you might pay a $10 copayment to see a doctor. You might pay a $30 copayment to see a specialist, or maybe you'd pay a $200 copayment if you walked into the emergency room. And that's different from coinsurance or cost share, which are two terms that mean the same thing. And that's a percentage. It's the difference between what insurance companies pay for our medical expenses and what we pay for our medical expenses. So if you have an 80-20 cost share, the insurance company is gonna pay 80% of your medical expenses and you're responsible for 20%. And then there's something called an out-of-pocket maximum. And this is probably the most important thing that anyone should know about their health insurance coverage. Because in a worst case scenario, it's the most that you're gonna pay out of pocket for your medical expenses during the year. And it's a math problem. So you get to add up what you pay for your deductible, plus any co-payments that you pay during the year, plus any co-insurance amounts that you pay during the year to help you reach your out-of-pocket maximum, which is that fixed dollar amount. So you might have a $1,000 out-of-pocket maximum, or you could have a $20,000 out-of-pocket maximum, depending on the type of coverage that you have. So to give you an example of how this actually works, Dan has spent a week in the hospital, and he walks out of the hospital with a $102,000 hospital bill. But he has a plan that has a $2,000 deductible, it's an 80-20 plan, and he has an $8,000 out-of-pocket maximum. So how much of that bill does he actually have to pay, assuming he's had no other medical expenses during the year? So first he has to pay his $2,000 deductible, which leaves $100,000 left of that bill, but he has an 80-20 plan. So the insurance company is gonna pay 80% and he's responsible for 20%. But then how much does he actually have to pay of that $20,000 bill? And the answer is $6,000 because he has an $8,000 out of pocket maximum, but he's already paid his $2,000 deductible. So the balance of what he needs to pay is $6,000 before he reaches that out of pocket maximum. And then his insurance will kick in and pick up the rest of that $20,000 bill. Now, I never suggest that $8,000 isn't a lot of money but it's better than the $20,000 bill he would have been left with if there were no out-of-pocket maximum or even the $102,000 bill that he started out with. So that gives you an example of how out-of-pocket maximums can be helpful. So there are some key protections that were included in the Affordable Care Act that have had a huge impact on the cancer community. And the first is about how insurance companies decide how much to charge us for our health insurance coverage. And that process is called premium rating. So previously insurance companies could look at whatever they wanted to when deciding what to charge us for our plans. And now they can only look at four things, whether or not you're buying a policy for an individual or family, because if you're buying a policy for a family and covering more people, they can charge you more where you live based on your zip code, your age, but they put a cap on how much more you can get charged as you get older. There was previously no cap. And then if you use tobacco, you can be charged more for health insurance. Now, since the ACA, some states have passed laws that said we're not gonna look at tobacco use, like California and DC. So what's missing from that list? Pre-existing conditions, health history, but also gender. Women have always been charged more than men for health insurance coverage, and that's no longer allowed under the ACA. So then the ACA went one step further and said, we're not gonna let health insurance companies deny people health insurance based on their age, their gender, their pre-existing condition, or really any other reason. If you can afford the policy, they have to provide it to you. So when we talk about pre-existing condition protections, it's really these two things together that make it a valuable protection because it's not really a protection to say you have to sell me the policy if then you can decide to charge me an astronomical amount for that policy. You can basically just price me out of the market so that I can't afford the plan. 
So when we talk about pre-existing condition protections, it really requires both of these things together. Because the bottom line means that if you have a cancer diagnosis, you can't be denied health insurance coverage and you can't be charged more because of it, which was really game changing for the cancer community and really for anyone with a pre-existing condition. But the ACA also did some really helpful things for consumers outside of that. So when an insurance company denies you coverage, so they say, we're not gonna cover a surgery or a drug or a particular type of procedure, uh, you can appeal that decision. And you can do that inside the insurance company through what's called an internal appeals process. But if your insurance company still comes back and says, no, we're not gonna cover it, you now have a right to go outside of the insurance company to an external appeal that is handled by an independent medical review organization that looks at your situation and decides whether or not it's medically necessary for you to get that care. And if that independent organization says that it is, that decision is binding on the insurance company. So that is an incredible benefit. And I actually call this the best kept secret of the healthcare system because most people take no for an answer. And you don't have to take my word for you. I'm gonna, for it, I'm gonna show you some data. But what is so interesting about this is where we have data across the country, we know that when someone goes through the external appeals process, on average, 50% of the time, their decisions are being overturned, which means 50% of the time people are successful when they get through the external appeals process. Now, the data at the bottom of the slide is actually for California. In California, it's 60% of the time that patients are successful. But what is so disappointing about this is that most people don't understand their rights to appeal. So this is actually some relatively new data from 2019 that showed about 40 million claims were denied uh, in 2019, but only 0.2% of those claims were actually appealed, which is terrifying when you think about the fact that 50% of the time insurance companies are getting it wrong. So that's about 20 million claims where if someone had gone through the appeals process, they'd be more likely to get access to the care that was prescribed to them by their medical team. So this really is the best kept secret of the healthcare system. So please spread the word. Don't take no for an answer. So the ACA also created some access to clinical trials. And the way that it did that is that it required private insurance companies to cover the routine costs of participating in a clinical trial. So prior to the Affordable Care Act, insurance companies would often say, well, if you wanna participate in a clinical trial, great, we're not covering anything related to your care for that condition, you have to pay for everything out of pocket but now insurance companies have to cover the things that are considered to be routine. So the things that would have been included in your standard of care for that particular medical condition. So things like office visits and blood work and imaging scans, all of those things that would have been part of standard of care have to be covered by the insurance company. And generally speaking, the thing being tested in the trial is covered by the trial. So it significantly reduced the out-of-pocket costs the patients were paying if they wanted to participate in a clinical trial. Now, some states actually had this protection before the ACA made it federal law. So sometimes the state laws are even better. Uh, and just in January, uh, the president signed into law uh, that Medicaid now also has to cover the routine costs of clinical trials in every state. Before it was up to states to decide whether or not they were gonna cover those, uh, and now that's federal law. Medicare, TRICARE, and VA plans also cover the routine costs of when you participate in a clinical trial. And we have details on this at triagecancer.org if you want more information. So with respect to coverage for telemedicine, a lot of coverage got expanded as a result of COVID. The challenge is the coverage is all over the map. So it varies greatly by the type of health insurance coverage that you might have. So we saw some individual and employer plans where it covered preventive services and mental health care and eliminated the out-of-pocket costs. So you didn't even have to pay a copay for those visits. Uh, Medicare under Part B covers telehealth. 
uh, but the co-payments are usually the same as in-person visits. Uh, and then it carved out some exceptions related to mental health and preventive services. Medicaid depends on the state. TRICARE and VA Health also covers telehealth for medically necessary services. So maybe it's actually the broadest coverage for telehealth. Uh, and it does include preventive care and mental health care. So really because it's all over the place and every insurance company is approaching it differently and they've made changes over the last year um, pretty frequently, the bottom line is you want to talk to your health, to your insurance company to find out if they're going to cover your telehealth visit. Uh, and your provider isn't always going to know how your particular plan will cover it or not. So it's a good thing to check before having that visit so you're not stuck with uh, high out of pocket costs. And in some cases, you might have to get pre authorization first from your insurance company before having that visit. So I do also just want to mention some other breaking news. Uh, the state health insurance marketplaces have been reopened for a special enrollment period from February 15th to May 15th. So if you don't have health insurance coverage right now, you can shop for insurance on the marketplace now. But if you have a marketplace plan and you want to change your plan, maybe because it doesn't cover your providers or you have high out of pocket costs, you also have the opportunity to make changes to your plan. So this is a really important thing because there are still, you know, 15 million people uh, plus who are uninsured, plus individuals who have lost health insurance coverage as a result of losing their jobs because of COVID. Uh, but what is also a good secret of our healthcare system is the financial assistance that are available to people who are buying plans in the marketplace. Currently, um, about four and a half million people who are uninsured could actually get a marketplace plan with a zero dollar premium. Uh, so that means you'd have free health insurance through the marketplace, but those individuals just don't know it's available to them. Uh, and then another approximately 5 million people could get a reduced cost plan through the marketplace as well, who are currently uninsured. So this is a another unfortunate secret of our system. I want to walk you through a quick exercise so that you can understand how to make choices if you have choices available to you. And so this exercise works if you're comparing marketplace plans or maybe your employer gives you more than one choice at work to choose from. Or maybe you want to compare what your employer offers to the marketplace. Or you can also compare your Medicare plan choices using the same exercise. So here are three examples of plans. There's a bronze plan uh, with $173 monthly premium and a $6,000 out-of-pocket maximum. A silver plan at $271 a month uh, that is a $5,200 out-of-pocket maximum. And a platinum plan at $398 a month with an $1,150 out-of-pocket maximum. So can you tell just by looking at these plans Assuming that you're going to hit your out of pocket maximum during the year, because if you're talking about cancer care, the chances of you hitting your out of pocket maximum is pretty high, which is actually going to be least expensive to you by the end of the year. And it's not a trick question. The answer is you have to do the math. You can't tell just by looking at them. Whatever plans you're looking at, you actually have to do some math. And the way that you do the math is that you take the monthly premium and you multiply it by 12, and because that's how much it's gonna cost you to have the plan for the year. And then you add that to the out-of-pocket maximum. So in this case, the platinum level plan actually ends up being cheapest by the end of the year by a couple thousand dollars. But you really couldn't see that because if you looked at the monthly premium, you would kind of get sticker shock because it seems so much higher but the out-of-pocket maximum is so much lower. And so that's why it's important to understand how the out-of-pocket maximum works and how much it can save you if you actually do some math for the plans that are available to you. But it isn't just cost that you need to be looking at. You also need to make sure that the plans that you're looking at actually cover your providers and the hospitals that you're going to and the prescription drugs that you're taking. Because if it doesn't cover those things, it's pretty useless to you. So 
The ACA also created a requirement that everybody have health insurance coverage. And this requirement was referred to as the individual mandate. And up until 2018, if you didn't have health insurance coverage, you had to pay a penalty of $695 for an individual or two and a half percent of your household income, whichever is more. Now, Congress in December of 2017 actually dropped the penalty for not having health insurance coverage to zero dollars, but it didn't go into effect until 2019. So the reason I'm mentioning this to you still is because a handful of states actually created this requirement at the state level so that if you don't have health insurance coverage in those states, you will pay a penalty. But the reason I'm mentioning this today especially is because this action by Congress actually triggered a case, a legal case. So in February of 2018, 19 states and two individuals filed a lawsuit in Texas arguing that because the individual mandate penalty is now zero dollars, that the entire Affordable Care Act and everything that was in it is unconstitutional and should be struck down. And so normally the U.S. Department of Justice is the federal agency that enforces or uh, defends federal law in court. Uh, decided that it wasn't going to participate because it actually agreed with the plaintiffs. So 17 states and the U.S. House of Representatives asked the court if they could be on the other side in the case and defend the constitutionality of the ACA. So ultimately, this case was heard in Texas and the judge in Texas ruled that the ACA was unconstitutional and the whole thing should be struck down. That was appealed up to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Fifth Circuit ruled that the individual mandate clause is now unconstitutional, but sent the case back to the judge in Texas to see if that piece of the law could be pulled out and the rest of the ACA could, st could stand. Uh, in the meantime, both sides in the case actually appealed it up to the Supreme Court of the United States, which is where the case is now. In November, uh, a few days after the election, there was a new Supreme Court justice added to the court and the Supreme Court actually heard oral arguments in this case. And we are currently waiting for the Supreme Court to actually decide whether or not the ACA is constitutional and if it can continue to exist, even if that piece of the ACA is unconstitutional. So if it can be severed from the rest of the law. The reason I'm taking a minute to talk about this now is because very few people know that this case is going on, but the Affordable Care Act touches just about every aspect of our healthcare system, including the things I just mentioned, like the consumer protections, like the access to routine costs paid for by insurance companies, like the external medical review, like the protections for pre-existing conditions. It is possible that if the Supreme Court decides to strike down the Affordable Care Act, all of those things would go away. And so we just want people to be aware that this case is going on uh, because we will likely hear a decision from the Supreme Court by June of this year. So I do just want to mention that that was a very high level, quick overview of health insurance information that everyone should know about uh, their health insurance coverage and how to get coverage. So if you want more information about these topics or others, Triage Cancer has a number of free resources at triagecancer.org, including free educational events. We have resources by topic. Uh, we have educational materials that we refer to as quick guides and checklists, and we have state-specific information on our website so you can find out what's applicable to you where you live. We know that some of these topics are not super exciting, like health insurance and work and estate planning. Uh, so we actually have a series of animated videos that highlight some of the things that are most helpful for people to understand, like how to pick a health insurance plan, what your options are if you lose insurance at work, how to find and pay for clinical trials. So those are available to you for free to watch on our website. And then we also host a resource called cancerfinances.org, which covers many of the topics 
that can impact your financial situation uh, and provide you with financial assistance resources as well. And so it's important to think about financial assistance as broadly as possible. When we talk about how to avoid financial toxicity, we actually start with health insurance. Making sure you have adequate health insurance is the best way to reduce your out-of-pocket costs. But then there are other things like making sure you understand your employment rights so that you can continue to work or take time off if you need to and replace wages. But even just when thinking about financial assistance, if you're having trouble paying a medical bill, maybe there's utility assistance that you'd qualify for so that you can use that money to pay for your out-of-pocket costs for your medical bills. So we encourage people to think as broadly as possible. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over for our question and answer period. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for volunteering your time with us today and to update us on blood cancer and how cancer care and monitoring has evolved after COVID-19. It is now time for the question and answer portion of our program. For everyone's benefit, please keep your questions general without many personal details. So Dr. Pamaraju, Ms. Connors, and Ms. Fozzie Morales can provide answers that are general in nature. And we'll take the first question from our web audience. Um, the first question is, when is a telemedicine appointment not a good idea? Um, and this could be for you, Andrea, or doctor. Uh, so from my perspective, as I mentioned in my presentation, telemedicine is not an option for any sort of emergency uh, that you might be experiencing. So if you are having symptoms of, let's say, a heart attack or, or something that requires an emergency consultation, that is not uh, something that we obviously would consider for a telemedicine visit. Um, but over to you, Dr. Pemaraju, what, what is your take on that in terms of what makes yeah. a good telemedicine visit? Yeah, I think that's very important what you said. Um, I would add in the blood cancer space, you know, we have, I asked my team at the beginning of the pandemic, start working on a way to do a virtual bone marrow biopsy. They haven't done it yet, okay? They haven't done it <laughs> yet, but, but you're right. So in addition to emergencies not being the way to do telemedicine, I think obviously for us, right, any, anything that requires a procedure, you know, that's a rate limiting step. So lumbar puncture, so in the back chemotherapy or, or drawing the fluid off, bone marrow biopsies, all of that is a little bit of a drag. So you have to come in for that. I think anytime... The blood work is interesting. There are ways to get blood work done, you know, remotely closer to home and then have those um, sent to your provider. But I would say the three categories are people who need procedures, which is a lot of our patients. Number two, if you're a newer patient to the practice. So I think even though some of my colleagues are able to do, Andrea, first time consultations, which I think is an amazing thing for a lot of our patients, I try to discourage that. I think the first visit's nicer to be in person, see the whole program, see the whole person. Um, and then I think another um, time to not use the telehealth visit is if there's a dramatic change in status. And I'm going to talk about something called art of medicine here. This is, I cannot really explain it to you, but in someone that I've met in the clinic, maybe once or twice, that's all I need. By the third or fourth visit, I can walk into the room and tell something's not right here. This is the same thing a parent can do with their kid, a loved one with their other loved one, spouse, et cetera. But this is something that is a tactile art of medicine feel kind of a thing. And if you can do the in-person visit, I'm not just talking about palpating lymph nodes or listening to your heart. I'm talking about a human being, spiritual, whatever, metaphysical presence that I can tell if you're in the room. So, so, so those are some, some of the issues that I think bring you physically to the clinic. And make no mistake about it, most of the hospitals that we're talking to, if not all, have made dramatic strides here in making it safe for you to come in and out, right? So yes, you might have to wait in the waiting area, but people are spaced out, masks. We're trying to wear face shields and masks. So if you have to come in, that's between you and your doctor, but let's let's not be afraid of the in-person visit if it's necessary. Sure, we have been getting a lot of uh, patients as well as their caregivers asking about swollen lymph, lymph nodes. Right. That That's something that would be hard for them to, to assess in a telemedicine um, type situation. 
Yeah, and and you know the physical exam. Let's be honest. Here I'm gonna, I'm like the magician who tells the secrets. You know the other magicians don't want you to say. But in the in the office, I'm dealing with complex blood cancers, MPNs, stuff that most doctors cannot necessarily pronounce the name of. And I've got a whole team working for me in my place, right? I've got the nurse, the PA. So you know the stethoscope and the physical exam is becoming sort of an, a dying art, isn't it? But in our practice, the lymph node exam, even the handshake the checking of the pulse, the hug uh, when you're going to hospice, the uh, sort of presence of being in the room and, and, and touching and doing the exam has just been robbed from us. And, you know, a lot of things that are maybe considered to be dinosaur age or anachronistic, they really tell you about who the person is behind the patient. They tell you the whole story. And darn it, you can't do that in this day and age. And it's one of the great things that we're missing. But you can still tell a lot being in the room, like you said. So a quick physical exam, a quick scanning to see how you're doing, uh, how things are going, how you answer questions, what your body language is like. These two-dimensional uh, Zoom calls can't, can't translate all that. So I think if your doctor's office is safe and okay to do it, a good mix of telemedicine and in-person visits, I really love your two guys presentations kind of talking about insurance and telehealth. I really learned a lot myself because what you guys put out there is a playbook for people to follow. And uh, Joanne, I think you were saying, don't take no for an answer. How awesome is that? If our people out there don't get anything else from anything I said, anything Andrea said, please listen to what Joanna nicely said. The art of the appeal for the insurance company or the uh, provider, you know, just to show them that, hey, your care, you're persistent, you know, some of these things we're learning on, on the job, aren't we? And so anyway, I, I just really appreciate this question. So maybe a mix of telehealth and, and in-person, depending on the acuity. Sure. And one thing that we did see at LLS is a lot of patients during the time where they could not bring a caregiver into their appointment at the clinic or at the hospital, they were able to partic participate in a telemedicine visit. Um, so caregivers actually did find telemedicine to be helpful to be in the room, as well as physicians found it helpful to meet some caregivers that they hadn't met before. Wow, what an important point. Um, you know, when I was rounding in the hospital the last couple of times, that was big. Uh, there are it's to the point now where the rounds during COVID, we, we won't, I won't even talk to the patient unless they have the chance to put the loved one on the phone or on the video conference. You know, before, you know, maybe they would communicate with their spouse later on or we would, but now we're doing it in the visit in the room. Number two, uh, you have translators of different languages. We had already been doing at Anderson before the pandemic, but it's been quintessential during you can have a translator beam in on a video phone and they can do it remotely. So any language you contract out. Uh, for loved ones who are um, not able to come in and, and the, there's a change in status, uh, maybe sometimes you're rounding and then, okay, we'll call the family later. No, we do it all now in person if it's possible. Uh, and as you said, try to put people on. Everyone has a smartphone nowadays, right? A lot of people do. So iPhone, Zoom, um, FaceTime, for example, this is so huge and it doesn't take extra time. It actually saves you time later on and then the family member can try to feel like they're part of the visit when before they never would have been um, uh, if they're not in the room. And our next question is for Joanna. Um, why do insurance companies decline to cover certain services if your doctor recommends it? Well, isn't that a great question? Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I, I hate to say this and sound a bit cynical, but the business model for insurance coverage is set up to deny people. And I think that that exists in the context of disability insurance as well. So the same um, recommendation applies to disability insurance. If you're denied for disability insurance, you should appeal that decision as well. Um, and so unfortunately, it is a business model. So there is an assumption that people will take no for an answer. And in fact, they do. And so therefore, the worst case scenario for an insurance company is they deny your coverage and you appeal it and then they end up having to pay for something they had to pay for anyway. 
Uh, so unfortunately, that's the system that we have. And I think that that applies across all types of insurance coverage. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from the telephone audience, please. Your next call is from Daniel from Montana. Daniel, please state your question. Your line is now live. Yeah, I hear a lot about uh, using these many fancy new experimental drugs to suppress COVID. Uh, now, are there any clinical trials that uh, are being done with the old standbys that uh, build up the central immune system through vitamin A, vitamin D, C, zinc, even cinnamon and uh, turmeric, rather than chasing these little insect-like creatures called viruses around and around? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm surprised at how many trials there are actually uh, with almost exactly everything you said. So um, for the old guard, it's kind of disappointing so far. I would say, you know, the vitamins, the zinc, the hydroxychloroquine, uh, they haven't really shown anything. So some of these actually might be harmful too. So unfortunately, a lot of the old guard standby stuff has actually been tried in some clinical trials not showing a whole, whole lot. The zinc vitamin stuff just came out. That's unfortunately negative, right? Because that's readily available, not there. Um, I think though, dexamethasone steroid is an old guard that we've been using for decades, and that has shown a benefit in, in, in a spectrum of patients with the virus. So, so in the old guard stuff, I agree with you, uh, caller. There's not been as many exciting breakthroughs. Boy, that would be great. Um, among some of the newer medicines, you know, that you're hearing about, I agree with you. Some of them are very costly. Some of these monoclonal antibodies, uh, remdesivir, BAM, et cetera. So we'll have to see where everything goes. Um, but I don't discount that there is still so some of the older drugs that may be used, right? The so-called repurposing of drugs. Uh, my colleague, Dr. David Fagenbaum, has shown this in Castleman's disease and other rare diseases. So don't give up hope. But I would say sometimes we try to make the data something that it isn't, right? And so I think sometimes home remedies, um, you know, two people, husband and wife have COVID, one takes zinc, vitamin C, the other doesn't. And, you know, so we, we have a lot of anecdotes out there, but, but the data is starting to come out. And I would say that um, let's keep up, you know, let's keep our ears and eyes open to see if any of the older uh, things apply. Thank you. And the next question, Dr. Pamaraju, are there time recommendations as to when to get the vaccine? For instance, if I'm post-transplant 30 days, is it safe for me to get the vaccine or do I need to wait a certain period of time? That's important. We don't know the answer. So the short answer is we have no idea. We are giving some guidelines at each institution, like you said, post-transplant, post-chemotherapy. Each clinical trial, each agent is going to be different. Each doctor is different. Um, I think there's two, three issues, right? So one is, let's take the example of post-transplant. We don't know yet what's the efficacy of the vaccine when you have no immune system or a reconstituting immune system. We don't know. So that's something we all have to figure out together. So let's work on that. Two is safety. Um, you know, is there a higher risk of reactions or side effects in someone who's post-transplant? We don't know that. So, right, we have to observe that. We haven't seen that by and large at all, really. It's, it's been very... very fairly uh, safe uh, overall. And then I think number three, what maybe our caller is asking is, are there any long-term problems, right? Let's put it out there. Even some of my healthcare colleagues were worried about, you know, you have an mRNA, a new technology, is there going to be some chance of second cancer, you know, all these things. So I think the answer is we haven't seen anything really a big signal so far, which is very encouraging, right? I got my vaccine. I got the Pfizer vaccine back in December, my goodness. So first dose in December, second dose in January. So I am over a month and a half, almost two months now post vaccine. So we only have short term follow up. So let's let's follow all these together, particularly for our immunocompromised patients, post transplant, post leukemia. But in so far, we have not seen a major signal for safety. That's encouraging. I know it's early. Uh, and but you know, in the in the coming months, we'll have more data for you. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from the phone queue. Our next call is from Nancy from Michigan. Please state your question. Your line is now live. Yes. Uh, after you have the uh, stem cell transplant, um, what happens after that? I mean, hmm. how long do you have to stay in the hospital? Can yeah. you go home? 
Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I can give some general pointers on that. That's pretty standard nowadays. So first for the viewers, allogeneic stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant, that's where we take the cells from a donor and then uh, infuse it into the host. The donor can be from uh, the self, which is called a syngeic transplant. We don't do that very much anymore, but from a sibling, which is called a sibling match donor or a stranger, so a match unrelated donor, or even from umbilical cord cells, or even now, can you believe it, from uh, son's daughter, so half transplant or haplotransplant. So now almost everybody has a donor from somewhere. Uh, the allogeneic stem cell transplant is what we'll focus on for your question. Um, you know, here's the answer. The answer is, so the syngeneic I was saying was from a twin, I should say the auto transplant is from yourself. We do still do the auto transplant. So let's just take the serious one where you get it from the donor, the allogeneic. In general, in general, you're looking at a one month process. You need to get the chemo beforehand, which is called conditioning chemotherapy. That's generally strong chemo immunotherapy. Usually the hair falls out, very strong chemo to open up or wipe out uh, the bad cells of the bone marrow and allow the bone marrow to be receptive to the infusion of the donor cells. Now at day zero, you're already in the hospital, you get the infusion of the cells, watch out for allergic reactions acutely, watch out to make sure that the body tolerates it. Now you stay in the hospital for a several weeks, up to a month, to make sure that the cells engraft. So that's called engraftment, similar to, I guess, a kidney transplant, you're waiting to see if the kidney takes. Now you're also looking out for what's called graft versus host disease, acute uh, GVHD. And then you're also looking out for infections, bleeding, all of the usual stuff in our leukemias and lymphomas. That process is variable. You're looking for the neutrophils, healthy neutrophils to come back, the graft to take. That can be anywhere from two and a half, three to four weeks. Make sure there's no infections. So you get out of the hospital around that time, but you're not done yet. Now the next three to six months are very important. You're gonna be following up what's called the post-transplant phase with your doctors, starting to look for chronic GVHD, chronic graft versus host disease, make sure there's no early relapse, make sure there's no infections, keeping up your hydration, your kidneys, all of these other functions. As you get through each month is, an, is a milestone, generally around three months, you'll probably do your first bone marrow biopsy to check to make sure you're still in remission. And then you'll start planning with your team if you're gonna get what's called post-remission maintenance therapy. That's a new thing that's now ready for prime time as of this viewing, which means that we're starting to look at stem cell transplant as a step in the journey, not the final destination anymore. I'm gonna repeat that. Maybe the stem cell transplant now is just another step in your journey and not the final be all end all. So in the case of AML leukemia, uh, FLT3 mutated, for example, we now have FLT3 inhibitors, pill, chemo that we give after the transplant as maintenance. So there's a whole new world out there. So the three main categories after you're done with the transplant are monitoring acutely in the hospital, as you were saying, up to a month, watching for infections, bleeding, uh, making sure the graft takes. A middle period of three to six months, watching for the same, but also for um, these other concepts to see if you need more therapy. And then of course the long-term maintenance, which is reconstituting your own immune system. So shots that you had when you were child, uh, right? Getting those shots again, watching out for chronic late long-term side effects, watching out for the GVHD uh, later on. So I would divide it up into that uh, kind of short, medium and long-term. Thank you so much for that explanation of autologous and allogeneic transplants. Thank you. The next question is for Joanna. There are a lot of changes with our health insurance and that has affected or caused delays with our treatment process during this pandemic. What is the best way to deal with these concerns? That's a great question. So if you know that you've been having trouble with your insurance as you are having appointments or if you're going in for treatment to check in with your insurance company ahead of time, uh, that also means talking to your healthcare team. So sometimes healthcare teams will check to make sure that your coverage is good before you go in for an appointment or check to see if you need any pre-authorizations where you have to get approval before you get that care from your insurance company. And if you don't have a healthcare team that is doing that for you, then you're responsible for doing that for yourself, which I know is one more burdensome step, but doing it ahead of time can help uh, reduce those delays and getting access 
to care and help make sure that you're not having to pay for extra care out of pocket um, that your insurance company should be covering. So I'm not sure that entirely answers your question other than the, you know, there's general frustration in dealing with an insurance company where they are um, delaying access to care by requiring patients to go through that pre-authorization process. But healthcare teams are very good at working with insurance companies to get you the coverage that you need. And then if, if an insurance company um, stops, um, coverage with a certain hospital that you go to as a cancer patient can you extend seeing your regular doctors or do you have to just choose um new a new oncologist right in the middle of treatment so it depends on uh where you're at in your care um I'm sorry, in your plan year for your insurance company. So for example, your insurance companies could have a new contract with a hospital or with a certain provider, or they could change the formulary, the list of drugs that they cover mid-year. So if you're in the middle of a plan year that goes from January to December and they make those changes in June, you can appeal so that you can ask for special exceptions so that your coverage continues through the end of the year for those providers and those drugs, and they'll be treated as if they're in network as opposed to out of network. But if it's at the end of a plan year and you're deciding if you want to stay with that plan and or to get a new plan, um, then you, they don't have to continue providing that coverage even if you're in the middle of treatment. And so that's why it's important to understand what your other options are for insurance coverage so that you can be a good consumer and find a plan that actually does cover those providers and drugs. And most big hospital systems now will actually have that information on their website. So they'll list all of the insurance plans that they take for that particular hospital or health system so that when you're shopping for insurance, you can check that site. But it's always a good idea to have conversations with your providers directly um, and then to also talk to the insurance company to double check that they're actually covering those providers. Sure. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from our telephone audience, please. Your next call is from Alan from California. Alan, please state your question. Your line is now live. Thank you. Uh, this is for the doctor. Uh, doctor, could you give us any information on the uh, what might be coming down the pipeline for new treatment and therapy for a leukemia. Uh, it's a little bit um, in, the, in the dark out here. So any information you have would be thankful. Sure. So thank you. Well, thank you, sir. Yeah, it's, a, it's exactly what I do uh, in my day-to-day -day practice. Um, so yeah, just to give you an overview, uh, I'm associate professor of leukemia here at MD Anderson. So our group, uh, you know, to, to be very honest and straightforward with you has really pioneered most of the developments in the last 20 years. So I feel honored to be able to be part of that. Um, the, what's going on in 2021 and beyond is I would divide it into three categories for you. So number one, in acute leukemia, so that's AML and ALL, the, the biggest developments are the introduction of oral chemotherapy. So pill chemos that you're gonna start to hear about in, in this year and beyond. In the last few months, we had approvals for oral versions of IV sub-Q drugs, azacitidine and D-cytidine. Very surprising to see all of this happening. I mean, of course, all the research has been for a decade, but uh, you're gonna see those drugs starting to hit the market. The oral azacitidine has specifically been FDA approved in the setting, or you know, will be approved uh, if it hasn't already, but it, it'll be available uh, in the setting of maintenance chemotherapy. So this is something brand new. So oral drugs approved for high-risk MDS and AML, that's that's completely kind of really cool. Um, also in AML, you have the oral drugs called the FLT3 inhibitor. So that's drugs such as mitostorin and gilteritinib, both FDA approved in either the frontline or relapse refractory settings, either as a single agent or in combined with chemo. And then IDH inhibitors uh, and venetoclax. So that's a big new thing. If you were diagnosed with AML just three years ago, Almost none of these drugs I just mentioned were even available. So that's mind blowing. All of that research is new and all of that's been translated into the clinic. The second category is in terms of immunotherapy, immunotherapy. That's where we're trying to harness the body's own immune system 
to attack the leukemia. Now you may say, hey man, isn't that just stem cell transplant? That's what you were just talking about. Sure, but as you can see, stem cell transplant is a million dollar procedure, requires 30 days in the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. So in this immunotherapy model in the acute and chronic leukemias and lymphomas, we're trying to ask the body's immune system itself to rise up and kill the leukemia. And so that work was largely based on the Nobel Prize winning work of our colleague, Dr. Jim Allison, who postulated that this could be possible. So by attacking a number of different breaks on the cells, CTLA-4, PD-1, PD-L1, et cetera, all, all these drugs are actually already FDA approved in the clinic for solid tumors such as melanoma, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, et cetera. So now we're moving those drugs into the blood cancer space, lymphoma, leukemia, in active late stages of clinical trials, and those are starting to come to the clinic too. And I guess you can also put CAR T cells, if you've heard of that, into that space as well. So. CAR T cells are where you take the patient's own cells, uh, send it to the lab, train those cells to kill a target, for example, CD19, which is present on malignant B cells and lymphoma, put it back into the patient, and then it kills the lymphoma. There are two, now three FDA approved CAR T cells that are out there. So everything I'm telling you about is just, it blows my own mind away. None of this existed even just five years ago. So oral chemotherapy drugs, in the acute leukemias, brand new, IDH inhibitors, venetoclax, FLIC3 inhibitors, oral agents of AZE and decidabine, all new. Number two, immunotherapy drugs and CAR T cells. And then a third category is in the chronic leukemia. So that's myeloproliferative neoplasms, MPN, so myelofibrosis, CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, and even in CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Again, the advent of oral drugs. So the JAK inhibitors and myelofibrosis, ruxolitinib and fidratinib are the two FDA-approved drugs with other JAK inhibitors in phase three late-stage testing. In CML, you have five or six drugs now all by mouth that you can choose from. Um, and then in CLL, you have the revolution going on with ibrutinib and venetoclax. Those are two orally ap approved and available drugs. So overall, what you're hearing from me is an explosion of research that did not exist five years ago. And in the last one year and now into this 2021, I just gave you the roadmap for what we and others worldwide are working on. So for, for patients and caregivers in this awful time of blood cancer, pandemic, winter weather, there is actually a lot of hope. And I would also say these uh, companies such as these uh, nonprofit organizations such as LLS, who's sponsoring this program that we're on now are actually not just helpful, but they're essential. I would say they're essential to the research, like funding the research, LLS funds research at very early stages, clinical trial support, and then awareness and education like we're doing here. So shout out to LLS for hosting us here and for really not just getting the information out there, but you guys are helping to fund the early stages. I think a lot of the viewers may be surprised to know that. Yes, definitely. We've, we've really helped, you know, push the needle and, um, you know, the drugs such as Givac as well as CAR T cell therapy, uh, we have been very involved with. And, and also, if I can plug in there as well, Lizette, the rare diseases too, the rare blood cancers, yeah. which as you know, I spend a lot of my time thinking about and, and doing, you guys at LLS have been at the forefront. Uh, organizations such as the Patient Empowerment Network, Patient Power, others have gotten the word out there. So diseases such as BPDCN, you guys were one of the first people out there to put it on your website, to fund the uh, pivotal clinical trials, to get the word out there, to have people on the phones to be able to hear. So even if you have a rare blood cancer, it's not rare to you or to your family or to your loved one. It's a disease that you're facing. And sometimes, as Joanna knows, the insurance company hasn't even heard of the disease. They're like, what are you using this drug for this disease? We've never heard of it. That's because there's only 500 people with it. Um, so, so I think this question really, it's a great question to kind of end our seminar with because it reminds you that research doesn't happen in a vacuum. There's real life people out there like our caller who are starving for this kind of information. And so it's up to all of us as scientists, doctors, and advocates to get that information to the people who need it the most. Definitely. And to also let folks um, with BPDCN and other of those rare types of blood cancers know that there are research studies and there are clinical trials out there right. Um, right. for all of those diagnoses. Well said, right. 
And Joanna, I do have a question for you. Um, if the United States Supreme Court strikes down the ACA, could your insurance drop you? Well, if the entire ACA is struck down, those uh, consumer protections would go away. So the answer to the question depends on what type of health insurance coverage that you have. So if you have an individual health insurance plan, it's unlikely that they would drop you through the end of the calendar year uh, because you have a contract to have that plan for the year, but they may not renew your plan. Uh, with employer-sponsored plans, we'd go back to a day where employer plans have to cover you, um, but they can impose what are called pre-existing condition exclusion periods for up to a year, where they don't have to cover anything related to your pre-existing condition. Um, for Medicare and Medicaid, that wouldn't apply, so you wouldn't be dropped from those plans, but there are even changes to uh, Medicare prescription drug coverage that would go away. So it took us 10 years to close the Medicare Part D donut hole, um, but that's in the ACA. So if that went away, would that increase costs for people on Medicare for prescription drugs? The truth is we don't exactly know because it's such a big law and it does so much that unraveling 10 plus years of implementation of that law is really kind of unprecedented. And so we don't exactly know all the details of how that would work. Thank you. I know that more than just one person on the call was curious. And also, Joanna, another um, question. My insurance does not cover all the necessary testing that is required to monitor my leukemia. Are there any grants available for paying for testing? So before grants, I would first say if they're telling you they don't cover the testing, that you could appeal that decision and to work with your healthcare team to argue why it's medically necessary for you to get access to that testing for your care. So that would be step one. Um, but then in terms of financial assistance to help pay for out-of-pocket costs related to testing and any other type of medical care, there are financial assistance programs out there, like the ones that the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society provide, as well as many other um, organizations for different things. And so we keep track of that at our cancerfinances.org resource on our website. So we have financial assistance programs there. Thank you. And as well as I will provide you the number um, to speak with an information specialist at LLS um, for specific programs that might be applicable for you. Um, doctor, one last question. Um, right now, you can't really choose which vaccine you get. Right. It is, it is known if is it known if one is more effective than the other for blood cancer patients or if one vaccine works better with the medications that I'm taking? Great question. Short answer, no, we don't know. I think what's been encouraging though, and I have to say as a physician and a scientist, I was amazed to see the efficacy rates of both Pfizer and Moderna, right? So mid 90%. And, and I think we're, we're starting to see the numbers as of this viewing, right? Um, yeah, February 23rd today, this week, the numbers that I saw, finally, there's hopefully, I'm hoping that there, it seems to be some kind of the start of a plateau. Um, no, we don't know. And I think it's an important question. I think I look at it more as classes of vaccines. So let's look at Pfizer and Moderna together. So the so-called mRNA vaccines. And then you're right, uh, as the, you and the callers are asking, yeah, I'm curious, right? Let's see how these AstraZeneca and Johnson and John, whatever other vaccines are available of the non-mRNA. I am curious. So we have no idea in terms of blood cancer patients. Um, I think in terms of your individual chemo programs, we haven't had any issues giving uh, the vaccine to patients who are on the oral uh, drugs, as we mentioned. You know, obviously, if you're on an IV chemo regimen, you have to plan it out with your provider, you know, possibly not getting it on the same day. And then remember the second dose. That's the other thing, right? With the mRNAs, you need a second dose. You need to have a strategy. If you're out of state patient, and you came in to get your vaccine, make sure you're able to come back and get it in three weeks. Make sure that the hospital is going to have it. Make sure that you have a plan there. Um, but I like the question. I think we'll know the answer to this probably in a year, probably not in the next few months. 
Um, and, and let's also remember that, as you said nicely, at this point, nobody can pick. you got to just take a slot whenever you have it and go for it. Um, and I think that's also a very important point that you, that you bring up. And another point that you brought up is that most oncologists, most doctors that are dealing with patients that have cancer are saying that patients should get the vaccine, That's but right. some patients are some patients are asking if um, if the clinical trials didn't have cancer patients right. within them or many cancer patients within them, um, is it really safe for them? Yeah, I mean that's the right that's the right answer. I mean we we didn't know that you know when we started doing it. We have the concept that out of all these volunteers, not all of them were completely healthy. So when you look at these papers, there were people who had cancer and and other comorbidities and conditions. There were large numbers of patients in the early vaccines. Right, it's not just hundreds; it was in the tens of thousands. Now some were randomized to placebo, and then frankly, now we've been doing it right in the real world setting as you would expect. So. So far, the rollout has been outstanding overall, I would say. Now we're into February, heading into March. But this is correct, what you said. There is no data. The data is unfortunately being generated by all of us, right? Providers and, and patients getting the vaccine in these first six months. So when you're evaluating these things, that's the conversation you have to have with your doctor. I think also remember different doctors and different institutions have different comfort zones. So if you're neutropenic that day, if you're thrombocytopenic, which means your platelets are low, right? Because it's a it's a sub Q injection, a muscular injection, I should say. Um, you know, so there might be some reasons on that particular day you you can't get it. But by and large, we've had a lot of good success vaccinating our employees, our staff, and patients. And you know, as always with programs like this, I have to emphasize I'm a physician myself in the clinic. Talk to your doctor, talk to your team, figure out what's right for you, what timing works for you. But be encouraged by my early experience so far that we have had a really great positive experience giving our blood cancer patients the vaccine. I'm very thrilled to see how how much we've been able to do from a feasibility standpoint, how safe it's been, the very, very few adverse reactions that we've seen. So make sure you know that, at least in this program, that I've had a very positive experience thus far. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pemiraju. Um, Andrea Connors and Joanne Fozzi Morales for sharing your knowledge with us today. And to all the patients, caregivers, and professionals participating in today's program, on behalf of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, thank you for sharing your time with us. Um, I do want to let you know that if we didn't get to your question, you can call us at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and speak with an informa information specialist at 1-800-955-4572. And information specialists are available to speak to you from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern time, or you can reach us by email at infocenter at lls.org. I would really also encourage you to visit the Patient Empowerment Network website, www.powerfulpatients.org, as well as the Triage Cancer website, www.triagecancer.org. They have great videos on both of these websites. And LLS offers a variety of education and support resources, including an online chat, which is free, moderated sessions, by oncology social workers. And we also have free education videos and podcasts. And we do offer programs that help individuals with blood cancers, financial programs, and you can find them at lls.org forward slash finances. Now, if you can please complete the evaluation for today's program at www.lls.org forward slash T-W-E-V-A-L or complete the form in your packet and return it by Tuesday, March 16th, 2021. You'll be entered to win a gift card. Please note that continuing education credit is not being offered for this program. Again, we'd like to acknowledge and thank AbbVie for support of this program. This concludes today's program. Thank you so much again for sharing your time and thank you once again to our presenters. Have a good day.